So we're here talking um, paper plant today at squiggly.co.uk. Thank you very much for joining us. How about telling us, introducing yourselves and telling us your role on the project? I'm John Cars. I'm the director of Paper Man. I am an animator. I've been animating for many years, and this is my first short film. I'm Christina Reed. I'm the producer. I've been involved with computer graphics for 20 years now, and um, this project really appealed to me because it was an opportunity to do, create a totally different look from anything I've ever touched before. Where did the idea come from, John? Uh, the idea really comes from when I was living in New York City years and years ago, um, commuting to work and being surrounded by all these people in this big city, but somehow feeling alone at the same time. And Sometimes you just make these random connections with strangers, like you make eye contact briefly and then they're gone forever. And I started thinking about, you know, what, what if this guy and a girl made this connection and they were like perfect for each other, but then they lost that connection. And what would happen if this guy was really fighting to get back this girl? And, and what would happen if the fates intervened and to kind of bring these two people back together? And what drew, what drew you to the project? I actually, I've spent so many years in CG and I'm really intrigued by how can it look different? How can we bring something different visually to the project? I came to it mostly because I was attracted to that, but over time got very engaged in the story John was telling. And there's a moment where Meg looks back from the train as she's pulling away from George. And I remember John saying to the animator, she needs to have a look like we could have been a very formidable couple. Mm. And I thought, wow, just the notion of destiny and we're pulling destiny to its very limit. Can we, can we, can we get these two back together again? The project opened up a whole different story for me. Yeah. So, anyway. so uh, Pigman's um, key selling point, I would say, is its, um, its technique and its, and its uh, unique look. Could you tell us a little bit about the look, um, about the blend of 2D and 3D sure. perhaps? Well, the look of Paper Man is, is truly a hybrid in, in the true definition of the word. It's, it's the best of both worlds, I feel, of 2D and 3D. So you have that stability and the dimensionality of computer graphics. And then you have that expressive line and, and that beautiful design and appeal, that human mark of, of, of hand-drawn animation. And, and it really, really the challenge was just fitting them together in a way that really felt like they were in harmony. Yeah. But what did you take away from each medium and what did you leave behind? I mean, what were the, what were the best things about 2D that you left in the film, the best thing about 3D, and what, what, what did you do to the project? Well, I mean, for the, th the 3D, I'm pretty seasoned. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of knew what to expect and what I was going to get out of it and um, I mean really the learning curve for me was more about just emerging as a director and how you have to be as a director but for for the 2D side I think the way that they had to handle the line was was very different than the way the animators had drawn their work before and it was a very calligraphic line it was they couldn't just chip away at it. They had to draw these long, fluid strokes. And that was something that was a struggle for them at first. But I think what I was amazed by was just how, you know, the first week you're like, I don't know if this is gonna work out, guys. And then the next week, they got a little bit better. And then by the third week, the people that you thought weren't gonna work out are suddenly the fastest people on the show and they're doing the best work. And I think just watching them Watching them train themselves and, and rise to the occasion, that's, that was the most amazing thing to see that from, you know, on the 2D side. I mean, um, it's very, I suppose, you could call it retro. It's got a retro look, a retro feel, 40s, 50s. I got um, you. The, yeah. <laughs> the character design um, somewhat reminds me of um, a classic sort of 60s um, Disney. Perhaps uh, George's face looks a little bit like um, Roger, slightly. In the He's build. a bit Rogery. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I like Roger. Everybody likes Roger. He's an amazing milk call design. Um, there's a lot to learn there if you start 
deciphering like what it is that he's doing and he has such good taste. Um, ultimately the character design in its final form was done by this guy Shiyun Kim who's just a brilliant character designer and he's really the guy that brought the, that calligraphic line into the design. But um, Glenn Keane was a huge influence and a huge help in getting Meg figured out and the, just the proportions and, and I think what we what we learned on Rapunzel getting that character with such big eyes and how do those big eyes like fit in that skull mm. that are like the size of baseballs um, we learned a lot on that about how to keep that appealing and how to have that all work together and, and Meg has similar proportions with those big eyes and um, but I mean, design-wise, I wanted them to feel like they could be right for each other. Like, he had to be kind of humble and like a real guy, but not too handsome and not too ugly. And then she had to be, like, really cute, but not so beautiful that she would seem, like, out of his league, you know? Right. When they meet at the beginning, um, they, they should already feel like they are a match, you know? When you, when you do a short at Disney, you're running in between the big feature productions. And John and I would take this sort of on the road at Disney and show people what we were doing and present it in various forums. And what was amazing was people would just gravitate to our project. So Glenn Keane wanted to come and do some tests. And she right. and Kim, who's a very in-demand character designer for our features, would come and help us. And over time, it just picked up this momentum where everybody would sort of wanting to know what was happening and yeah. how can I help and what can I do and do you want, do you want me to fix that rig or would you like me to take a shot or yeah it and was, so it it's just, like the hot project in the building it, it, it for a while drew it a lot of talent the, yeah it became the little engine that could yeah it was yeah. Kind of exciting yes. and the talent sponge everyone's yeah, been a little bit yeah. yeah a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, were Disney worried about the style at all? Was, was there any sort of, uh, were you slightly apprehensive because it's quite a departure from what we're used to um, shot in shorts these days? No, there were, there were several months where we were exploring what we were going to do and playing with the pipeline and trying different approaches and we hadn't shown John Lasseter um, and it got to the point where it was time to show him our first shot and it's that close-up of Meg looking through the flowers of the plane and I think there was a moment of we all love this and it's taken us a long time to find it yeah. and God we hope he loves it too. Yeah. And it was just so exciting when he stepped, he watched it loop over and over again with that cat mole. And he sort of said, yeah, yeah, I could yeah. watch a whole film like this. Right. And we knew we had done it. That's right. That was a big breakthrough. An exciting moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> could you tell us a little bit more about some of the other guys that worked on the film, perhaps? Um, a few of the key players besides Glenn Lee that were already mentioned. I'd say there were four people that were, that really made the project same. Yeah, I mean, Patrick Osborne is an animator. He worked with me on Tangled, and he's super talented. But he has a he has a way of approaching computer graphics that is really like light on its feet, where he doesn't he doesn't overdo it, and he does things that are really fast and loose, and almost like have a raw edge quality to it. And his techniques were really handy in in, in just building the look and the and the and building the worlds because we did that with almost nothing like we didn't model very much of anything it's just like scene flats with texture maps thrown on and stuff it's very minimal it doesn't look minimal but it, it there's hardly anything there um, and then Jeff Turley who's young art director he was a trainee just a few years ago um, an incredibly bold eye like there are these like shafts of light and shadow that he just took that idea and ran with it and made these images and compositions that are so powerful and the rhythm of the cutting um, like when it's all horizontals and verticals and when it's diagonals and when it's high contrast and when it's low contrast all these great decisions that an art director would make he's right there making them <coughs> even at this young you know early part of his, his career he's, he's tremendously talented just interrupt for a second about Jeff. Um, we were trying to do something that's very, very much the antithesis of what CG lighters tend to do. What they want to do is bring shape and volume to something. And we knew that if we had done that, that the CG wouldn't meld with the flat lines. 
So we actually took the CG and attempted to flatten it, and literally lighters wouldn't, it took them a while to understand the aesthetic, and Jeff would be there every day painting on their frames and demonstrating how he wanted them to flatten the look and get the stronger contrast lines and remove shadows and just be much more strategic about where they would place lights. So he is really the brainchild Good. behind the light of this film. Yeah. Who are the other two? The other two are Hyunmin and Sarah. Uh, Sarah Aris and Hyunmin Lee, they were the two hand-drawn lead leadership people for each of the respective characters. So Hyunmin worked on Meg, the girl, and Sarah worked on George. And they each just ran with their characters. And I mean, the young women at Disney are the 2D and CG are the best women in animation, I think, in the world anywhere. They're, there's so much talent there, and there's just a different kind of understanding that they bring to it. And I'm really excited to have worked with both of them. The music is... I was going to say, what about the old women? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Women of all ages are, bring a unique insight. It's very cool. That is indispensable. Very diplomatic. <laughs> Sorry. The, um, the music uh, is still sort of bouncing around in my head. That plays a key role as well. I mean... Um, Everyone is saying that. Christoph Beck is going to be so proud when I start telling when I start explaining this to him, but yeah. yeah, the music is by Christoph Beck, and he's done like all the Hangover movies. He did Under the Tuscan Sun. He started oh, by Buffy doing the Buffy Slayer. the Vampire Slayer. Is that that's how he got his start? He's he's one of these composers that like maybe he's not quite a household name, but when you start looking, you're like, oh, he did that, he did that, he did that, he did that. And the sound editor at Disney was using his music from other films as temp tracks for our reels. Mm. And I was just thinking, this is good. This guy's really good. This is a good fit. And um, there was just a point where we were like, let's call him up. I mean, he's right over in Santa Monica. Let's, he's right here. So he came by. He's super excited because, you know, we're animating to his music, literally. Like, he's driving the animation with his music. and. Um, I just, I, I knew uh, the music was a really important emotional part of the storytelling for me. It had to be right. And, and I think for the early tracks, we struggled a little bit to find the right tone. Uh, but for that last track, uh, he just came out of left field with that. And it's, it's an anachronism, like it doesn't fit the time period. And I think that's great because it feels so fresh. But the emotional drive that it has, I think just, I, I listen to it in my car and yeah. um, people have been asking me for the MP3 files and stuff, but because everyone is saying how much they love it. And, um, and when he first gave it to me, I was like, this is so good. I'm listening to it all the time in my car. And he's like, yeah, I don't usually listen to my stuff, but I listen to this one. It's particular, you know, he like made an exception because he likes this one so much. So I think we just got so lucky with that track at the end. Mm. It may be a big seller for people who have a dreary job and catch the subway to work. <laughs> they, they, they there aren't any people like that. No. <laughs> what if they're listening to the music and then they turn and they see each other? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you make people fall in love, John. Well done. It could happen. <laughs> what's, what's the look? Was it... Was it supposed to look like a photocopy? Was it supposed to uh, resemble the, that sort of um, style? I think it was just about seeing these illustrative looks that the art people were doing, like Jeff Turley was doing, and that we, we see these amazing pre-production paintings all over the studio for all these different projects, and they're so... They have such a great tooth and, and texture, and they're exciting. And, and sometimes I feel like that excitement kind of fades away by the time you get to the final CG image. And I, I felt like, and Jeff felt this way too, um, can't we push to keep that energy in the, in the artwork all the way up to the final frame of the image? So we started making mock-ups of what final frames would look like that really looked very illustrated with that kind of raw edge quality and a little bit of grain in there. And in the end, it was just about finding that balance of like, is it too much grain or is it too little? 
is it is the edge broken up too much? Does it does the line boil or is it stable? I mean, all these little decisions that you know the devil is in the details kind of thing. And I think the details make the design. The details are not details. The details make the design. That's a Charles Eames quote that I think is just so so right because it is about the details. If you don't get the details right, then the whole the whole battle is lost. Last year at Annecy, when we met, I finished the interview that by asking you. Day. Yep, when I, <laughs> I by asking the inevitable question of what you're working on at the moment, and it was oh. the toughest question because you couldn't talk about Paper Man. Yeah, well, this is easier to answer now because what I'm working on at the moment is I'm animating on Ralph. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here. This is what I'm doing right now. I'm yeah. showing this short here, and that's super exciting. But I'm, I'm animating on Wreck-It Ralph, and after that, there seems to be interest to, to see what more we can do with this technique. And it's not, not to say that we're working on a feature film with it. We're, we're not right yet. Um, maybe we'll get to that point, but I think the feeling from John Lasseter and Ed Catmull is like, okay, that's cool. What else can we do with this? Like, let's push it a little further. So that's what I'm going to be... I'm hoping to do that next, like in the fall. Kind of roll up my sleeves and get get, get into it again. But as a as a producer, would you say that this is the kind of thing that that excites Disney and it's something that we could see oh. develop? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just the notion that we can build on our legacy, our 2D animators, our 3D animators can come together and form a look that hasn't been seen before. I think mm -hmm. this is opening up a whole new frontier of possibility at Disney. And just adding fuel to the fire of the conversation, which is so exciting. Yeah, and it's very cool. The fact that this show even happened, the fact that this short film even got done, and it, that it exists and it looks the way it does, I think is it. It works as kind of a symbol of where the studio has, how it has shifted over the last five years or so, and the environment that, the change in the environment that has happened since John and Ed have come down and really created a place that the artist feels safe to like take more risks and explore and, and push for new ideas and, and like for instance when I found that there's this drawing tool that's being made that was being made in the building and it's called Meander by this guy Brian Whited and when I found that, I'm like, oh, I discovered this drawing tool and this is gonna be perfect for Paper Man. Well, the truth is that Ed Catmull, five years ago, said, we need to put more research and development into 2D drawing tools because we need to revitalize that. So it's like, kinda, I just came along at the right time of, of like part of this larger plan to kinda reinvigorate the whole medium. Um, so, yeah, honestly, there's really cool stuff happening at the studio right now. He's always there, Red Catmull, isn't he? Ready for the next he's like, software that's needed. He's like or? the quiet storm. Like yeah. he, he, he's doing a lot, but he does it by, I think, enabling and delegating hmm. um, to and getting the right components in the right places at the right time, and then like seeing what happens. And I think Paperman is one of those things that happened. And what's on the list to be, to be produced? Um, well, can't talk about it yet, but um, really next, what's next for me is the 2014 film. The 2014 film, the as of yet unnamed 2014. Unnamed yet, coming soon. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll finish the interrogation there. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you both very much for talking to Squid today and enjoy the rest of Annecy. Thank you very much.